education. And we worked on this webinar with the Citizen Lake Monitoring Program, Water Action Volunteers, um, Wisconsin DNR, and the First Detector Network. Ooh. Sorry, my slides are stuck. Um, just an overview of what we're all going to cover during this webinar. Um, just a pretty quick introduction um, to welcome you all. And then we're going to go over the different species groups we'll have. And each presentation will be 20 to 25 minutes. Um, we're going to first cover submerged aquatic plants and then go over the aquatic and wetland animals that we should keep a lookout for. Uh, riparian plants and upland wetland plants that you might see when you're um, along lake streams or wetlands. And then we'll have a, a question and answer period. So the species that we're going to review are all species that are identified, almost all of the species that are identified in um, NR40, chapter NR40 is our invasive species identification, classification, and control rule. So this is species that we've identified as issues when the, within the state. We've um, said that they're invasive and we want to be able to keep a lookout for them. So we selected target species from within NR40 that we'll see when we're out in lake streams or wetlands. Um, so you can go to our NR40 website to learn more about the species that we identified and regulate. For each of the species that we're going to cover, we're going to go over just key identification characteristics. So certain things about each species that you need to look at to be confident in your ID for them. And then we'll talk about um, just the different parts of these plants or animals. Then we're gonna all share phenology information that was put together the, by the Wisconsin First Detector Network. And you'll see in these slides, we'll have the list of the species and just to show you the symbology so each presenter doesn't have to go through it. Um, there's going to be different colors for the life stage that you'll see at the time of year. Um, we'll also have symbology for detectability. If it's a hollow circle, it's not detectable during that time of year. If you only see a quarter circle, it's low, half is medium and full is high. Um, and like I said, that can be found at the First Detector Network and we'll provide that uh, a link to where you can see more information later in the PowerPoint. We'll also share distribution maps for each species and there'll be small uh, screen clips of this map that you see in the state of Wisconsin. For the most part, we're pulling our maps from the lakes and AIS mapping tool that's available on the DNR website. And it's tied to all the data that we have in the surface water integrated monitoring system, which is where we put, enter all of our data for monitoring efforts for aquatic invasive species. Um, where you see the green check, it means it's a verified UH water mole foil. And then some of these are, are just lines if it's along a section of stream where it's found. And um, if we have a, a hash mark, that's going to be a polygon. Um, so they're, they're not all going to be big like this with the big check marks. They'll be a little harder to see. You can see this Vila Sonida County. Um, so not all the maps are going to be totally visible in the PowerPoint, um, but you'll be able to access them through our mapping tool. Um, and that's all I had for, for the intro, but we're going to start off with Paul on the submersed aquatic plants. So Paul, I'll stop sharing my slides and then you can take over. Okay, thank you, Maureen. You can see my slide okay? Yep, looks good. All right, great. So hello, hello everyone. I'll be taking uh, care of the first part of the webinar today on submergent and floating plants and we'll start to transition to submergent animals and then move our way up the shoreline and conclude with more upland species. So I will start things off with the phenology chart that Maureen just mentioned. So again, this is available on the Wisconsin First Detector Network website and it shows uh, the best time to be looking for any of these species and shows different uh, times that you can see different characteristics within each species. So I'll be talking about each one of these in this order today. First one being Carolina fanwort. This is a species that we do not yet have in Wisconsin. It is a prohibited species under NR40. It's been found in Michigan before. Uh, it is actually well established in a couple chains of lakes in lower Michigan. 
And it looks very similar to our native water marigold and a few other native aquatic plants that have these highly dissected leaves. This one is uh, identified best by looking at one cross section of the stem where you can see the leaves are opposite, meaning that there are two at any given point on the stem. And they're separated by a fairly long stalk, fairly long being maybe three quarters of an inch. So it's not really long, but in the picture there, at, right at the top, you can see that that, uh, that pair of leaves are well separated apart from each other. And then on the bottom, they have a flower that is just above the, sur the surface of the water. It's white with six petals. And next to it might be just a couple of tiny floating leaves. If you look just to the, the upper right of the flower there, you can see this tiny little uh, kind of sword shaped green floating leaf. They're very small. And it just serves to add a little bit of buoyancy to hold that flower up. So as I mentioned, we don't have any populations known in Wisconsin. It is a species that's been used in the aquarium trade and water garden trade fairly extensively. Um, not so much anymore, but it's certainly possible that it, it could be here already at this point and has gone undetected or could be introduced at some point. So it's good to keep an eye out for it. It does look similar to the water marigold here. Water marigold is a mostly soft water species in Wisconsin. Uh, so typically the, the northern half of the state or so is more commonly uh, has more lakes that, that would commonly have water marigold in it. It is our only aquatic aster. So it does have a fairly large aster type flower that is stuck out of the water a few inches. And the way to tell this apart from fanwort, not only by the flower itself, but also by looking at the leaves there around the stem, they are not separated apart by that long stalk. So it's really one of these examples where you, you have to look kind of closely at the leaf arrangement to see um, which species it is. All right, moving on from that one, Brazilian waterweed is another prohibited species. It has been found once in Wisconsin in Portage County in 2009, and it was quickly eradicated. It was in a private pond uh, and hit with a couple of herbicide treatments in order to remove it. Um, if you're familiar with common waterweed or Elodia, it is a very common species uh, of native plant in Wisconsin in lakes and streams and wetlands and all kinds of aquatic habitats. This is related and it looks kind of similar except it's way bigger. So you can see the nickel in the photographs there. It's commonly the, the diameter of at least a quarter, um, sometimes twice that. So it can be a very large plant compared to the natives that it looks kind of like. So we're looking for leaves that are in a whirl or a ring around the stem of at least four and the leaves are serrated on the edge. So if you looked at with even just a tiny bit of magnification, you'd see a lot of very sharp teeth along the edges of the leaves. And as I said, we don't have any populations currently existing in Wisconsin as far as we know, but it's another one that is very commonly seen in the aquarium trade or was and is not quite as commonly seen anymore. And similar to that is another species that it's also related to called hydrilla. This is one that has been causing problems in the southern United States for decades, but is uh, a recent discovery in northern Illinois. So it's not very far away. It's also in Indiana, lower Michigan. So uh, it's not far from here. And it's another one with these whirls of leaves of at least four. You can see a, a ring or a whirl of five there with the serrated edges again. And in the in the sediments just below the plant, just an inch or two into the sediments, you'll find these tubers. And it's basically like a tiny potato. It's a starch reserve that creates a new plant from the energy stored within that structure. Um, none of our native species that look similar to this will produce any tubers. So that's one of the definitive things you can look for. If you do find a tuber on a plant that looks like this, it is hydrilla. The flowers on really all of the plants within this, this group are quite rare and they're very delicate. So any kind of chop on the water from waves or props or fish swinging, uh, swimming by or anything can often break those flowers off. So they're not often seen because they're so easily broken. We did have one population in 2009 in Marinette County that was treated and was removed. So as far as we know, we do not currently have any hydrilla in Wisconsin. 
Now this is the native that I mentioned, the common waterweed or Elodia or Elodia, very common species. There's another one that's related to this that's also native, uh, somewhat less common northerly species. But this one tends to have a, a whorl of three leaves that are not serrated. If you look under really heavy magnification, you can sometimes see a couple of teeth on there. But um, those other two species, Brazilian waterweed and hydrilla, have teeth that are large enough that you can see them usually without any magnification. And this tends to have this whorl of, of quite smooth, um, three quite smooth leaves. They are not serrated on the edges. They're also not serrated underneath, which hydrilla is under the the line that runs down the middle of each leaf is called the mid vein, and underneath that, there would be a bunch of spines on that as well if it was hydrilla. I see a question in the chat about the plants spreading by seed or rhizomes. Um, none of them produce rhizomes, but they produce very effectively by fragmentation. So the plants can lay down and create new offshoots from uh, any part of the stem that touches the sediment. And in this photograph here, right under the nickel, you can see one of these adventitious roots coming off of the stem where the stem itself is producing new roots that could, uh, could take hold and then create a new plant from there. And as far as seed goes, they, they do not spread very effectively by seed. It's mostly fragmentation. Okay, so moving on to a floating one. Um, this is a species that is, again, very common in the water garden trade or was. It is now um, illegal to sell. And um, it's a floating plant that was sold for, it, it was often called an algae buster. Um, the idea was that it would cover the surface of the water and block sunlight from reaching algae underneath. So it was effective at killing the algae or preventing algae growth because the algae wasn't seeing any sun. It also has large fibrous roots underneath and the idea there um, when, when you would, as far as marketing goes, was that these plants would suck a lot of nutrients out of the water and also compete with the algae for a nutrient source, thereby further reducing the, the likelihood of an algae problem in the pond. So it forms these large floating clusters. Each leaf has a swollen base. It's full of these very large uh, airy cells that are very buoyant. And so it holds that cluster well up into the, uh, on top of the water. It has a lot of buoyancy. Each leaf then has this large uh, sort of sail on top. It's very glossy and very tough. And the, the wind will catch those sails, if you will, and it'll break the clumps into smaller clumps, which then float around and move populations to different parts of a water body. The bottom photo there is the flower spike that this one creates. It's a very attractive flower, which is another reason why it was commonly sold in the water garden trade. It has five petals with the top one with this interesting uh, blue and, and uh, green or, or yellow spot on the top. And underneath, as I said, long purplish roots sometimes can be a couple feet long and they just dangle down and feed the plant by grabbing nutrients right from the water column. We typically see this one a few times a year. Uh, it's just the result of water garden dumps, we think. So uh, every year, oh, for the last four years, I believe in Lake Winnicani, uh, west of Lake Winnebago, we found populations there. We found them in the, uh, in the uh, Mississippi River in Pool 5. We've seen them in a couple of other scattered locations across the state. Again, it seems that people are just dumping them in some easy access point to any water body. And whether they can survive the winter is a big question. This is a, really a zone 9 or zone 10 plant. It's really a subtropical type species. So there's a lot of debate whether this species actually could withstand a Wisconsin winter, but we err on the side of caution and just try to remove it just in case it would be able to survive the winter here. Uh, Chris in the chat asked where the Price County location was. That was in Fifield. I believe it was at a wastewater treatment plant or just downstream from one. So the water was artificially warm and uh, pretty sure that's that's where it was and yeah Amanda just put in Green Bay also it was found in in Green Bay recently 
Okay, so the only thing that would likely be confused with water hyacinth that is a native species is our wild calla lily. This is a common species in bogs and soft water lakes where um, a lot of organic material and sphagnum bogs are adjacent to the lake or a river. Um, it does have these large leaves that stick up that are sort of the same shape and color as a water hyacinth. The flower is very different as you can see here. Uh, if you're familiar with skunk cabbage or uh, jack in the pulpit or something like that, it's in the same family as those plants. It has a fairly boring looking uh, flower spike with this, this white hood around it. Very different than the very showy uh, spike that the water hyacinth uh, uh, creates or produces. And the leaves on wild calla are produced from a creeping stem. So it just slowly creeps out over the water, it floats and sends up one individual leaf at a time, a few inches apart from each other. Water hyacinth is a floating cluster of plants or a cluster of leaves where many, many leaves are produced from one single point at the, the crown of this floating plant. So a little bit different growth habit to it as well. Okay, European frog bit is one that we have not found here in Wisconsin yet. It's in the Eastern Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I believe it's been found in the Detroit area also, so Eastern Lower Michigan. And it's more of a problem east of there. It looks like a bunch of tiny lily pads. The pads only get to a few inches across, so quite small compared to uh, our native water lilies here. And the flower is also quite small, about the size of a quarter, and has three large white round petals with a yellow center. Each of the plants, somewhat like water hyacinth, uh, creates this floating cluster of leaves that spreads by what's called stolons. And the stolons are little creeping stems that uh, are sent out in, in multiple directions and can create little plants called daughter plants just uh, juveniles that are produced by a, a mother plant. And in this case, and in the case of water hyacinth as well, it can spread these stolons in four directions at the same time. So one parent plant can send out four stolons, basically 90 degrees from each other and create additional plants. So eventually any of these floating cluster forming plants can form a pretty solid mat of vegetation where they're all connected to each other and it moves around as one large mass. On the bottom, you can see that the underside of one of these frog bit leaves, it's very inflated at the base. You can see those very large cells near the stem attachment point, and those provide a lot of buoyancy to the plant to keep it on the surface. So again, we don't have any here in Wisconsin as far as we know. One possible native species you may confuse it with is water shield. But water shield does not have any notch in the leaves. It's just a little football shape. And all of our native water lilies would have notches and also the frog bit. I'll go back to that. You can see there is a, a little notch there in that heart shaped leaf. Water shield does not have that. It's also got a very slimy coating on the stem and the undersides of the leaves, which you can see in the lower photo there, especially as the new, uh, new leaves or new flower stalks are forming and has these very very slimy coatings on the new tissue. Parrot feather is another prohibited species that we have found a couple of times in Wisconsin. It has a submergent form that looks very much like any other milfoil. It's in the milfoil genus, Myriophyllum. And it has a, a very large emergent portion as well. And what you can see in the lower photo is the submergent leaves and then you can see it popped out of the water and created a very different looking emergent portion. So that is the same plant, but it's got a very different form in order to adapt to an area where it's not supported by water and it can dry out because it's in the open air. So the leaves are very much reduced. It's a slightly different color even. Um, and it's really just an adaptation for being out in the open air instead of being in the water surrounded by moisture all the time. In the top photo, you can see the little flowers that are formed at the base of each leaf. So that's called the leaf axle, where a leaf is meeting the stem. That's where all the flowers are produced on this species. 
And we found this a couple of times, Mississippi River Pool 5, that was back in 2013, I think. And also in Dane County, it's been found as well. So uh, it's popped up a couple of times. It's another very popular water garden species. So it's certainly possible that we may find it again in the future. It looks similar to this other invasive. This is a, a common restricted species, not prohibited. So it's a lower classification than NR40. And this is one that we have uh, fairly common. That, uh, that second bullet is, is out of date. We're at about 890, I believe, right now across the state. So it's fairly well, well distributed across the state. Um, it is another member of this, this milfoil genus, which parrot feather is in. They all have these very feathery leaves, typically in whorls of four. There is one milfoil that I'll just say, so nobody corrects me, but there is one that doesn't have feathery leaves, but uh, it's a native species and we'll, we'll leave it at that because it's a fairly rare species anyway. Um, so all the other ones have these feathery leaves. And what you're looking for on a Eurasian milfoil is that the leaf is in a whorl of four or sometimes more, and each leaf is divided into at least 12 pairs of leaflets. So if you take one individual leaf and count the number of leaf divisions along one side, you'll get at least 12. And there it is. So this is what it tends to look like. If you take a cross section of the stem, you'd find four leaves attached in a ring or a whorl around that stem, each one of them having at least 12 uh, leaflets on each side of the leaf. So there's one single leaf. You can either count uh, all the way through or just count along one side and get at least 12. And this is one of the common fragmentation uh, species. It, it likes to spread by fragments. It doesn't spread a lot by seed. Um, it can reproduce sexually through flowers and seed, but it mostly relies on fragmentation to move itself around. And what you see here are the adventitious roots that are developing out of the stem from these fragments that are floating around. Whenever those fragments would reach any kind of sediment, whether they sink or float into shallow water and then start to contact the sediment, the roots can go into the sediment and start a new plant from that little piece. Here it is growing next to our most common native species of water milfoil, the northern water milfoil. Two things that set this one apart fairly obviously is the color. The Eurasian milfoil tends to be pretty red at the top in the summertime and northern milfoil tends to be very green. You can see that the, the Eurasian on the right is growing to the surface a lot faster and branching much more heavily. The northern milfoil often is just a single column in the water and uh, is slower to reach the surface. And the other difference is shown at the bottom of the screen there, where you can see the number of times the leaflet div or the leaf divides into leaflets is much fewer as well. So you tend to see uh, four to eight or so uh, pairs of leaflets on a northern water milfoil leaf, whereas the Eurasian milfoil tends to have that, that 12 or more number. All right, brittle naiad is a prohibited annual. Most of our aquatic plants are not annuals, they are perennials, but the naiads are annuals. The brittle naiad is uh, our only prohibited invasive species of naiad. We have several native species as well. And this is entirely submergent. There are no floating leaves, there are no emergent leaves. The flowers are all below water. So everything about this one is completely under the water. The leaves tend to curve downward uh, and it's a very brittle plant, which is suggested by the common name of this species. Most of the time what you'll find is these little heads of the plant where the leaves are clustered together at the top of each branch. Those are often floating around on their own because the plant is just so brittle that those heads tend to break off commonly. And within the leaf axles, you can see a couple I think you can see my cursor here. So right here, there's a seed in the, the junction of these two branches here. Another one down here, another one here. So as these little heads break off, they often have a couple of seeds within the leaf axles of, the, of each head. And they will fragment and get carried away on a, 
another plant that floats by or a piece of driftwood or it could be anything. Um, and that's a way for it to spread itself around locally throughout one ecosystem, uh, potentially moving from one body of water to the next also. The leaves are slightly serrated. Uh, if, if your eyes are good, you can see them without any magnification, but uh, typically with a 10x hand lens or even less, it's pretty easy to see the teeth along the margins of the leaves of brittle naiad. And you can also see the curving shape that's common in this species. So here's the distribution of that one. We do have um, seven populations here known. So it's, it's not common by any means in the state, but it's uh, scattered across the southern half or so of the state. And we have other species that can be mistaken for brittle naiad. The slender naiad is a native species, and this is a very common one. The leaves tend to be straight. They don't really curve much. They do have teeth around the sides, but they're not evident without a lot of magnification. Um, and it tends to be this very bright green color. And it's not brittle. The spiny naiad is one that is considered an introduced species here, but naturalized. So it's not a native species, but also not one that tends to cause any real major problems either. So it's not really managed, uh, not considered a major nuisance really. And that one has very obvious teeth. Uh, they're very large, very easy to see without any magnification. And it also has spines on the stem itself, which brittle naiad does not have. So if you see any spines on the stem, you can see in this upper right photo, just to the right of the nickel, there's some spines there on the stem. That would give it away as spiny naiad. That's a species that's pretty much just in the southeastern part of the state. It's occasionally popping up in other parts of the state or, or uh, can be found in those areas, but really mostly in very hard alkaline lakes of the, the southeast part of the state. And I put these two different photos of spiny naiad in there because there are these two different forms. So the top one has a very wide leaf. The bottom one has a very narrow leaf that can look kind of like the brittle naiad does um, with that very narrow leaf. But again, the teeth are very obvious and you'd be able to see the, the spines on the stem as well as the leaves. Okay, starry stonewort. This is a fairly new one to Wisconsin. It was first found in September of 2014 in Little Muskego Lake in Waukesha County and has since been found in additional locations in the state. This is actually a very large type of algae, um, not what you'd normally think of when you think of algae because this is in a different group that is much different and much more complex than a simple free-floating algae species or uh, filamentous algae or something like that. So these can grow up to six or seven feet tall. They have a central stem that makes them look like a plant. And if you're familiar with Cara or Nitella, those are common species or common uh, genera or groups of species in the same family. And they tend to have this central stem with these, these leaf-like structures that come out. So again, it looks very much like a plant. If you uh, get technical with these species, the, the stem is called the central axis or the main axis, and the leaves are actually called branchlets. So you'll see in the first bullet, I have leaves slash branchlets. Branchlet is really the, the correct term, but you can just consider them leaves and that's totally fine. But uh, just be aware that that really means the same thing in uh, this case. So those leaves or branchlets, are in whorls again, typically a ring of five or six around the stem. And the whole plant is very smooth and bright green. And the lower, or sorry, the upper branchlets on the plant often have these bract cells that stick out. So it looks like the branchlet is actually forking. This is the branchlet here. And these narrower things that pop out of, this, uh, out of the branchlet are called bracts. And those form where the reproductive structures end up forming on the plant. So it has this asymmetrical branching uh, forking type pattern at the end where these brac cells pop out and the, bra the branchlet is longer than the brac cells and that's really what the, the important thing to look for. Um, if that's difficult to look for, the much easier thing to look for is the presence of these little white stars in the sediments. That's where the, the starry stonework gets its name from. 
These are like little tubers. Again, it's a starch reserve for the plant to store excess energy and create a clone of itself sometime later in the future. So it produces these little stars that are uh, typically five to eight millimeters across. So that's not a large structure at all. If it's sitting on your finger, you can certainly see it, um, but it's not really big. Um, and they tend to have these these kind of inflated lobes on them. It looks like a star with typically six points on it. Sometimes it has more than that. And they're produced an inch or two into the sediment on these little clear threads that look like monofilament fishing line. If you pull this up at any time of the year, it tends to have some of these, these stars or ball bills, they're called, hanging on to those threads. So it, it tends to be a very easy characteristic to look for. So here's the distribution in Wisconsin. We've got about 20 locations here, including, unfortunately, Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay, and Lake Michigan in Door County. So it is in some very large water bodies, which makes it really difficult to try to manage. Um, the rest of the sites have been managed in different ways because we're still trying to learn how to best deal with this species. Um, other states have been dealing with it for longer and haven't had a whole lot of success in controlling it in any kind of long-term sense. So we're trying to figure out what the best approach is. All right, one of the native species that looks similar is one of the species of Nitella that I mentioned before, the slender stonewort. This is a group of many native species. And again, these are, these are actually species of algae that are just very complex uh, groups here, group, uh, complex species of algae. And these ones are also delicate and very smooth and green, um, although they are far more delicate than a starry stonewort. They tend to just collapse when you pull them out of the water. Starry stonewort actually holds its shape quite well when you take it out of the water. So that's one way to separate these two. You would not find any of those ball bills produced in the sediments, those little stars. And the branchlets tend to have a, a pretty symmetric um, forking at the end. So every time you see a branchlet, uh, there tends to be this fork at the end where the, the two parts are roughly equal. And even where there aren't reproductive structures further down the plant, you'll still find this forking because it, it occurs pretty much on the entire plant. Yellow floating heart is another small lily pad-like plant. Um, it is another water garden escapee or a release um, from water gardens. Pads are similar to frog bit and then they get maybe three to four inches across or occasionally a little bit larger than that, but fairly small compared to our native water lilies. It does have that notch in the leaf, but the leaves tend to have this scalloped edge and that's different than what you'd see on any of our water lilies around here. So that could be a clue if you just see a leaf and it happens to have this very scalloped edge, then that's a clue that it could be yellow floating heart. This one's been found just a few times in Wisconsin and has been eradicated in, in I think all but one of them at this point. So the flowers are produced above the surface. They have a fringed edge on the, uh, the edge of each petal and they're held about three or four inches above the water. The seeds are, they kind of look like little ticks. They've got all these long um, projections that are um, like little silica tubes that, that pop out of the side of the plant and it aids in the buoyancy of the seed and mm -hmm. also allows it to stick better to things so it could stick to other plants or um, possibly to an animal or something like that. And this one spreads very effectively by rhizomes that are really well anchored in the sediment so it's very difficult to get this stuff out. If you pull it by hand you really have to get into the sediment and gently work those rhizomes out of the sediments. If you just use a rake or something to just grab it from the top and yank on it, it'll break the leaves off and the rhizomes will remain intact and just sprout new leaves. So it's not a real great option to use a rake. There was a population in Forest County that was removed entirely by hand by just a couple of people um, that spent maybe, oh, I don't know, Chris can correct me, but I'm thinking maybe 10 or 12 hours total um, with two people to remove that population over, the, over a couple year period to, to monitor for new sprouting. 
So it's an effective method for sure. And here you can see known distribution. The Forest County population is not showing up on here, um, but it was reported in Forest County as well and, and removed. All right, water lettuce is another floating plant that also spreads by those stolons that I mentioned before. You can sort of see the stolon pattern in this photo here on the top where the largest plant in the center of the photo is the mother plant. And you can even see the lines underwater where those stolons are. That's the stolon reaching over to this little daughter plant over here on the right. There's another one going to the lower left, producing another plant there one going straight left and one going up. So they produce these large mats of water lettuce floating on the surface. It also has these large roots that form underneath and dangle down into the water, much like the water hyacinth does and frog bit also for that matter. Um, so it pulls nutrients directly out of the water column. And this plant is a very unique looking plant. There's really nothing else that looks like it it's very, very soft and very lightweight. The leaves are pretty much just air. Um, very squishy, fuzzy, soft leaf. And it looks a lot like just a head of lettuce or a head of cabbage floating on the water. So that's where the name comes from. The flowers are extremely inconspicuous. They're produced in the center of each cluster at the base of a leaf. Uh, very, very tiny flower, a matter of millimeters across. So it's not likely something that you'd ever even notice. And we found this one a few times as well, since it is a common water garden species or was, uh, it's, it seemed to be often just dumped into local ditches and rivers and lakes where it was a convenient point to just dump some plants at the end of the season. All right, curly leaf pondweed is a, a common species around here. Um, not as common as you get into the northern part of the state, but quite common in the central and southern part. It can grow in streams and lakes and wetlands. It's not very picky about where it grows. Uh, we think it probably arrived through ballast water when uh, ships are, are dumping ballast water from other parts of the world into our ports here. Uh, it was sold as an aquarium plant for a while, and it may also have been introduced when common carp were stocked from Europe in the 1800s. It's a plant with a sort of backwards life cycle in that it grows from October through June. And uh, so that means it's gone for most of the summer unless the water is very cool. It, it doesn't like warm water. So when the water reaches a certain temperature in the summer, it just dies back and uh, is gone until the fall. It does release nutrients when it dies into the water column. So those nutrients then feed algae blooms and it can cause water quality issues when it dies back. So this is a plant that has uh, a serrated leaf. Um, it is our only pondweed that has a serrated edge on the leaf. And I think I have a picture coming up where you can see that much better. Um, it does have rhizomes and what's called a turion. The turion is a little um, condensed structure on the branch where many leaves are, are pulled together and the stem is very dense and hard. And it's a place where the, the plant is storing extra starch material for uh, a clone of the parent plant to form later on. In this case, since this plant has a different kind of life cycle, it is dormant through the summer and it sprouts a new plant in the fall and grows through the winter and the spring of the following year. And again, that, sorry about that bullet being outdated. It's a, we're, uh, we've added about 20, locations there. So we're at 930 or 40 or so documented populations in the state. So here you can see that serrated leaf, very large teeth or very obvious teeth when it's magnified a little bit. And the leaf tip tends to be quite dull. We have about three dozen species of pondweeds here in the Midwest. And this is the only one that is not native here. All the other ones are beneficial native species. This is the only one that is non-native. It's also the only one that has a serrated edge. So if you see a pondweed with a serrated edge, then you know it's curly leaf. It also has three veins that run through the leaf in most cases. Sometimes it's up to five, but it'll never be more than that. And you can see those three veins here running from the base of the leaf to the tip. 
identifying pond weeds can be kind of tricky and one of the ways to identify them to species is looking at the number of veins that run through a leaf. So here you have three to five and any other species that looks similar to this would have way more than five veins running through it. So here's a distribution map basically showing that it's uh, pretty common in the southern part of the state, not as common in the north. And here's two pondweed species that are natives that sometimes are sent to me uh, through pictures or specimens. Um, uh, people are thinking they're curly leaf, but uh, they're not. One thing you'd be able to look for immediately is whether the tip is round or sharp. Both of these species have sharp pointed leaves. They both have way more than five veins in them and neither of them have serrated edges. So any of those things would help to distinguish curly leaf from a native pondweed. All right, and the last one is water chestnut. This is not one that's really anywhere near here yet. It's, um, it's really in New York, Pennsylvania, um, Eastern or Southeastern Ontario, um, really that area of the country, not around here at this point. Um, that's me in New York in 2013, I think. Um, that's in Northern New York near Lake Ontario where water chestnut is somewhat common. And you can see those very large floating rosettes of leaves that it forms out there with these long dangling stems that hang down underneath. So it has these waxy floating leaves that are sort of triangular with a very serrated edge and uh, these long stems hanging down. The fruits are, I, I meant to throw a picture of the fruit in here, so sorry about that. It's got a very hard spiny fruit that's a couple inches across and has these four very angry looking spines that stick out of it. They're serrated. Um, it's a really nasty looking fruit if you were to step on one when you're swimming it's it's a pretty unfriendly plant um, so not something we have around here but something to watch out for if you see a floating rosette of these triangular leaves like that uh, not something we want to see around here and again we don't have any populations in wisconsin it's never been documented here and we don't have any populations known from surrounding states either so it's very much an early detection species at this point all right, so at this point, I will turn it over to Ilana to start talking about aquatic animals. Great. Um, can you enable screen sharing? If there are any questions, I can take those while Alana's getting her slides up. Uh, Paul, I need you to enable screen we sharing. We can also for take me. some questions at the end from anybody's section. Paul, I don't think you heard Alana. She needs you to make enable her to share her screen. I can see your screen, Alana. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Having some technical difficulties as usual. Uh, <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll start on aquatic invasive animals. Um, there are fewer of these than there are the submerged plants. Um, so we're going to go through 11 species today with few lookalikes. Um, and you'll notice that I, I don't have a phenology chart up for these and that's because they are, they live in the water. Um, so they are there year round. Um, if you can get into the water to find them, uh, most likely um, if they're there, they're going to be there. So, We'll start with the with the faucet snail. Um, it's a it's a right-handed opening snail. It's oval in shape. Um, it's about five to six whorls, 
and it um, it does have an operculum, so it is able to seal that shell. Uh, I, I didn't include a picture of the operculum specifically, but it, it is distinct in that there are concentric rings on just the operculum itself. Um, we do have several populations in Wisconsin, um, in the Lake Winnebago area and the Mississippi River. Uh, the, next, the next species we have is the spiny water flea. Um, and you notice on the map when Maureen mentioned before that we have some, some polygons that show up instead of check marks that uh, we have the blue, which isn't the greatest color for these polygons, but showing where the spiny water flea is more so than those check marks. Um, these are very small animals, uh, quarter inch to half an inch. Um, and they ha they're distinct in that long spine that they have and that dark black eye. Uh, they can commonly be found on the, the fishing line toes in kind of big groups of almost hair looking uh, creatures. Uh, but again, that, that big black eye is what's going to be distinct on them. Uh, the next two species are different mystery snails. We have the Chinese mystery snail um, and the banded mystery snail. The, the Chinese mystery snail, it's smooth. It's um, two inches long and approximately the same size wide with six to seven whorls. Uh, and what's distinct about the Chinese mystery snail and the banded mystery snail are, is the, the banding on those snails. So they're, they're distinctly striped. Um, this one's olive green and found uh, pretty much all over the state except for the, the Southwest. There aren't as many verified populations. And then the, the banded mystery snail is more brown and white kind of mottled looking, but still has those distinct bands. Um, it's a little bit smaller than the Chinese mystery snail um, and still has that right-handed opening. Um, they do have a native look-alike. There is a native brown mystery snail. Uh, and you'll notice that the difference here is that while there are striations in the shell, there's no distinct banding there. Um, they're also a little bit smaller than the snails, than the, the, the invasive snails. Um, but as snails are able to uh, be different sizes, that, that's not necessarily the best factor in determining native versus invasive. Um, that would be that, that coloration. Uh, the next species is the Asian or Asiatic clam. Um, these are really distinct in their texture. So you'll know it's uh, an Asian clam just by running your fingernail along those ridges and kind of feeling how deep the grooves are. Uh, they have an, the, the inside of the shell is often a purplish color and sometimes there is a purple band is one of the um, concentric rings on the shell. Um, when populations show up, they can really carpet the bottom of a water body. Um, and form kind of, just become kind of the, the, the substrate of that water body. So we do have some distinct Asiatic clam populations in the state. Um, I'm trying to see, yep. Uh, that relatively newer ones in in the Rock County area, and there is a a native lookalike for the Asian clam, and that's the the native fingernail clam. Um, the distinct difference there is just the texture of the shell and the relative size. Um, fingernail clams don't get much bigger than the average person's fingernail. Um, and they're, they're gonna have a relatively smooth uh, outer shell as opposed to that, that clam with the Asiatic clam, which again is, is distinctly ridged. Uh, 
Up next, um, we have the, the quagga muscle and the zebra muscle will be the, the following slide. Um, you don't have a map for the quagga muscle, the, the, unfortunately. Um, the, the biggest trouble here is going to be differentiating the quagga muscle from the zebra muscle. Um, and some of the ways to difference are that this is a, a much more rounded uh, creature with an, with an asymmetric shell. You can see that in that lateral view there. Um, and the, the bissel on the quagga muscles are near the back of the animal. And those are those thread-like silky fibers that help the, the, the muscle attach itself to substrate. Um, and this picture down at the bottom of the slide kind of shows what the distinct features of the quagga muscle are um, versus a different, the, the, the zebra muscle. So if we go on to the zebra muscle, you'll see I have a similar uh, picture to show what the differences there are. Um, and it's a much more symmetrical uh, animal, um, both sides of the shell looking mirror image of each other. Um, those bissel fibers are much more central to the muscle shell um, with distinct populations in the Winnebago area, the Lake Michigan area. Um, the Mississippi. Um, and it looks like we have some questions in the in the chat. Um, and thanks, Paul, for answering some of them for me. Uh, I'll just read them out loud so that people can can kind of know what's going on. Um, someone asked if the water fleas swim on the top of the water, and the answer there is no. That they're uh, they live in the water column, um, so that's one of the reasons those toes are sent out down into the water column to kind of pull them out of the water. And as far as the invasive snails and the damage they do, um, there's the same issue that we have with a lot of the invasive species in the, their competition with the native species, but then also faucet snails ca um, can carry certain certain parasites, and when water and they tend to climb high up on the, the grasses in the stream or, or at the edge of the lake. Um, so waterfowl will find them a, a good food source, um, an obvious food source, just kind of hanging out right there. Um, but they can infect the waterfowl with this, with this parasite that can be uh, deadly. So with that, move on to our, I think our one and only fish in these slides and the reason that this is uh, aquatic animals and not aquatic invertebrates. Um, the round goby found just north of Lake Winnebago. Um, when they're young, they're a, a solid gray color and they take on this more mottled color that you see in the, in the photo here as they, as they age somewhere between three and six inches long. They can be just kind of held in the palm of your hand. Um, and what's distinct is that they have a single pelvic fin with suction cup-like properties. Um, the next species is very well distributed. Uh, across the state, and I think that most folks are probably familiar with it, um, and that's the rusty crayfish, really distinguished by those red rusty spots on the sides of its body, um, and also by the, the black bands on the tips of the claws, but mostly through those rusty colored patches um, that give the rusty crayfish its, its namesake. Uh, continuing in the in the world of crayfish, we have the red swamp crayfish, um, which I believe does have a, a second verified population, not just the one in uh, in northern Dane County, but um, it's, it's it's very dark red. It's two to five inches long. Um, What's distinguishing about it is that black wedge-shaped stripe on its abdomen. Um, 
and it is commonly confused with the white river crayfish, which we'll look at the next slide. Um, but moving on to that, I would take a, a good look at the claws of the red swamp crayfish on this slide because that's going to be one of the distinguishing factors between the red swamp crayfish and the white river crayfish. Um, and we'll look, we have a, a question in the chat about how serious of a problem are the red crayfish. And I'm going to pass that off to Paul or Maureen to, to answer that question um, at the end of this section of the presentation. Um, so again, taking a look at the claws of the red swamp crayfish and looking at its native lookalike, the white river crayfish, which still has that distinctly bright red, dark red, um, body but can have more more brown of a color. Um, the White River Crayfish has very long and narrow claws and unlike the the Red Swamp when the when the claws are closed there's no space between the top claw and the bottom claw. It's um, they close flush with one another and that would be that and the the slender features of the claws would be one of your distinguishing factors there. Um, so these two are very commonly confused. Uh, but not so much with the, with the rusty crayfish. The last species we have is the, the New Zealand mud snail, more, mostly an issue down here in South Central Wisconsin. Um, it's got a right-handed opening, seven to eight, whirls on the shell, um, although they're very hard to count because the snail itself is so small, um, maxing out between four and six millimeters. Um, like the faucet snail, the, the New Zealand mud snail does have that operculum that it can close up and seal its shell with. Um, and they, they reproduce very dramatically um, asexually via cloning. Um, only only females exist in this in this part of the world, but it doesn't matter because of asexual reproduction. Um, and with the speed at which they can reproduce, they can carpet um, water body bottoms. So while well, it might be really hard to discover a single one of these snails, um, groups of them. Are, are easier to identify uh, just just sheerly because of the numbers. So I'll take a second to look at the chat box again for questions and then um, we will move on. Uh, Maureen or Paul, would you like to, you guys are the more of the experts than I am on, on I the, can touch. the problems caused. Yeah, I can touch on the red swamp crayfish. Um, so they're gonna predate upon um, other animals. Um, they'll be voracious eaters, just like the rusty crayfish with the vegetation, but they also attack um, young fish, macroinvertebrates, um, and they're pr fairly prolific. Um, the other population where the check box didn't show up in your map was near a couple of small ponds in Southeast Wisconsin, where we spent close to a million dollars to we believe we eradicated the population, but that required us to, to fill one or two of the ponds um, and they knew some pretty heavy chemical um, and then completely replace and line these privately owned ponds and then put cobble back in to have less suitable habitat for them. Um, there was that one occurrence in Southeast Wisconsin and then where she showed on the map and uh, was it still Dane County or, or towards Sauk? It was in Sauk City where they were released um, near the Wisconsin River at the Sauk um, Wastewater Treatment Plant. There was a population of about a thousand that had been dumped, some living, some dead. Um, but law enforcement fortunately found out within hours of the dump and were able to dig trenches and put up silt fencing. And then they hand removed a, maybe a thousand. We've been monitoring the site since and we'll be working with citizen volunteers um, as we can. So it's, it, they're very concerning and anytime we see anything about a crayfish boil, somebody follows up to make sure they're not red swamped to make sure that the restaurant hosting the crayfish 
Boyle is aware that these are prohibited species in, in Wisconsin, um, and they mostly agree. Can I add a little bit to that, Maureen? You sure can, Chris. It, one of the other issues with the red swamp crayfish is they have a tendency to burrow, so they can become really destructive on, you know, the shorelines, or especially if there's a dike system uh, or, or something like that. Um, I was able to work down in Germantown when we first found those, and we were able to dig out some of the burrows, and some of them extended, you know, almost two feet, three feet back into the, the bank, so that's another issue with them. And I'll just uh, jump in again quick too with the rusties are they get extremely abundant in some situations and they tend to just eat anything. Uh, they'll eat plants, they'll eat fish, they'll eat eggs. Um, any kind of invertebrates they run into, they'll kill each other and eat them. Um, and so they become a, an issue for that reason. They're kind of a big bully of the crayfish world. Uh, and to Valerie's question, uh, as far as finding remains washed up, if you think you found a red swamp crayfish, um, please send me some pictures and we can figure that out because they're not known to be in your lake, Valerie. So that would be really interesting if they are there. I'm guessing they're another species. Uh, it could be a white river crayfish maybe, or it could be um, perhaps large rusty crayfish. So let us know. I see Chris just put a, something in the chat as well. So yeah, certainly you could send them to Chris as well. Great, thanks guys. Um, there are a couple other questions. I'll start with Marty's question about there being a lack of predators for the snails. Um, as far as the New Zealand mud snails go, um, they're not incredibly nutritious and they, because they are able to seal up their shell uh, so effectively, they can pass through uh, the fish un unscathed and therefore they're not, <clears throat> they're not really an adequate food source um, there. It's, it's, it's not an effective uh, control method. Um, but I will pass on this question to Maureen or Paul about, um, do any of the snails carry the parasite that causes swimmer's itch? I don't think that any of the snails that you discuss do. Paul, you might be a bit better suited to answer that. I seem to remember that maybe the banded mystery snail can be an intermediate host. Um, I'm going to, Chris Hammerla is, is on the call. I think he may remember. I thought we both attended a presentation at the Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference a while back and thought I remember hearing that, but I can't remember for sure. That's the only yeah. one that I think was possible. Yeah, Paul and I attended a presentation. It was either there or Lakes Convention, but the, the studies had shown that the bandits, the Chinese, they weren't, while there was a potential, they, they could, they weren't like the number one vector. It's actually some of our native snails that are the and I don't remember which ones, but it was native snails that were the biggest problem for swimmer's itch. So just because you have a pile of the invasive bandits or Chinese does not mean that you're gonna be inundated with swimmer's itch. Great, um, well, we will, I will pass on the screen sharing so we can look at some more plants. Okay, I'm getting set up to share my screen. Sorry about this. <laughs> okay, can you guys see that okay? It says repairing invasive plants. We see it. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I gave the intro on Maureen Ferry, the Aquatic Invasive Species Monitoring Lead for the DNR. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you about the riparian invasive plants that we'd like you to keep an eye out for. And I have, I think, nine species here to go over. I list them here. Um, the first I'm gonna talk about is purple loosestrife, which is widely established in the state of Wisconsin. You can see the map in the lower 
right hand corner. Uh, purple loosestrife grows to be anywhere between three and seven feet tall. It has a square semi woody stem um, and op with opposite leaves. You can see this picture drawing picture in the in the upper right corner um, and it has five to seven petals on the flowers. You can count the petals on the flowers and no petiole. So that means these flowers grow directly off the stalk of the plant. It's not going to be bushy um, like some of the native lookalikes. I'll show you on, on the next screen. So it, it makes it very distinct that you'll see this tight spike of bright purple, almost magenta flowers typically growing along road ditches. Um, these are the common lookalikes. Fireweed, which looks very similar with the flowering stalk, except these flowers do have a pedicel, so they're going to look bushier. Um, there's gay feather, which doesn't have those opposite leaves, and then blue vervain, which is going to be multiple little spikes um, growing off the, the top of the plant. Then there's yellow iris, which has these beautiful showy yellow flowers that are about three to four inches wide, and they only have three, three petals. It's a popular garden plant that sometimes escapes. Um, they have broad sword-like shaped leaves um, that make it pretty distinct, but a lot of things look like that that I'll show you on the next slide. They grow really upright and stiff. Um, and they grow to be about three to four feet tall. These are also widely distributed as you can see in the map on the lower left corner. Um, and they're easily mistaken for other things if they don't have those really distinct yellow flowers. Like the blue flag iris, um, so they have a blue or purplish colored flower, but the same sword-like leaves. Um, cattail will also, when they're not flowering or have those spikelets, those brown spikelets, um, those leaves are pretty similar too, just not always as wide. And sweet flag that you see on the far far right, um, but they are not going to have those bright yellow flowers, but um, you can easily mistake it with just those sword-like leaves. The next plant is flowering rush, which is from Africa and Eurasia. Uh, it's a really cool plant. It has these three pink flowers that are in umbels. They have three petals and three sepals on each one of the flowers within that umbel um, that are just so distinct. There's nothing else that looks like the flowering rush when it's in flower. And it also has a, not a square stem, but a triangular stem. So with three sides to it. Um, it's fairly common in the state, but not everywhere, as you can see on the map on the far left. Um, things that it could be mistaken for if you don't have those pink, really distinct flowers. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Um, the stems are actually unique too, if you know what to look for. So the stem, stem is gonna be spongy and it has a cup-shaped base. It's easier to show with my hands, but you can't see me in person. Um, these stems each come down together. They're parallel so to form in this cup. And then within these roots, you will find these small bulbs and other plants won't have that. Um, it's really going to be easiest for the casual observer to see it when you have the flowering stalk. And I th think that I have flowering rush included in the um, phenology chart at the end of my PowerPoint. So you know when it flowers. So a lookalike is going to be burr reeds. Burr reeds also have this triangular stem, so it's going to look identical to flowering rush if you don't have the flowers. Burr reach does have so it's Sparganium species, has these little like bulbs of spiky looking flowers. Um, you will see those um, more commonly than you would see like those pink flowers. So you have to keep an eye out during that right time of year. Java water dropwort is probably a species you haven't heard a lot about, um, Enothea Havonica. Um, it's also called Vietnamese parsley, Japanese parsley, Chinese celery, or water celery. It's a creeping perennial, so it becomes a big issue when it's along streams. This is a stream in southern Wisconsin. Sue Graham took a picture, took this picture. She's the uh, lake coordinator in southern Wisconsin. Um, so she also works with like citizens and lake groups um, that come in for grants and she helps them apply for grants and get these species removed. 
Um, Java water dropwort looks like a parsley. It looks like flat parsley, so parsley like what you'd buy at the store. Um, this grows about four to 12 inches long and three to eight inches wide to give you some kind of a size reference. It's mostly gonna be in this just solid green color, but there is a cultivar that they call a flamingo cultivar, which you see on the right that has these white edges, white to pink edges that um, look a lot like Bishop's gout weed, um, which are one of the lookalikes I'll share. Um, it has an umbel of tiny white flowers, so similar to how that purple uh, flowering rush has the umbel of the pink flowers. This has just has small little white flowers growing off the, the stalk, um, the side of this hollow jointed stem. Um, this is a plus, plus plant from that same population that Sue Graham had photographed in that previous population. To me, the press plant looks a little bit like uh, cilantro or parsley um, if you were to, to flatten it out for what the leaves look like. And there's only a few different populations in the state of Wisconsin, the one in South Central and then two in Southeast. Um, and here's just some pictures of the lookalikes and anything in the carrot family, and I think that Anna is gonna go through a couple of these species, um, are gonna be tricky if you don't have the trained eye. That's why taking a photograph or getting specimens are gonna, are gonna help a lot and checking with somebody somebody else. Um, but you'll see they all have that jointed type of stem and then similar leaf structure where it looks a little bit like parsley or cilantro. Um, and here's a picture of the bishop gout weed that had the agapodium that has the white edges that I said that one uh, cultivar looks like. And there's also natives that this looks like which are Chinese hemlock and sweet sicily which is more of an upland plant. Oh, just to show you distribution, even through the United States, it's not terribly common. We have those three locations in the state of Wisconsin. There's not a ton even in the United States, um, but it's a little trickier to identify. So it's good just to keep an eye out so we can get on it um, sooner. Reed managrass is the next species. Probably you guys know it more by its Latin name, Glyceria. Um, it's a rhizomatous plant similar to the Java water dropwort. Um, so it, its roots grow through the sediments and that's how it can spread too. Um, its inflorescence is an open panicle. So you see the, the stalk of the grass will grow up and then you've got the panicle of the little flowers on the top of the grass. Um, this genus, the Glyceria genus in general, has angular bend in the leaf and then a detached ligule. So the angular bend that you're going to look like is look at is very characteristic. You see the bend here actually even has a lighter color where this creates a pretty distinct curve and then you see this white color. Um, if you see that, it's, it's going to be Glyceria and we'll talk about how, what else to look for. Um, and Glyceria, a lot of grasses even have this um, ligule that you can even peel back this part of the leaf and this ligule is free, it's not attached. Um, this genus also has closed sheaths. So you can see how there's this papery part of the grass that you can kind of peel this part away from the main steam stem. Um, and then it grows together here. You see that the stop, it stops here and then it's a closed sheath, everything to the right. Um, so this just comes together. It doesn't go all the way to the base of the stem. So the Glyceria maxima, um, the genus is pretty distinct in that the upper gloom has one vein and the parallel veins on the lemma um, are here too, but it's very easy to see when you know what to look for. So the glooms are going to be like the bottom, you could say scale or leaf structure that's on the flowering part. So like this is the bottom leaf or bract we could call it for the gloom. Um, and this is the whole flower of just this one part, but this bottom, uh, well the upper gloom <laughs> has just this one vein that you can see it's just this brighter red color. And then the par there's parallel veins on the lemma. So down here you can see this is that paler gloom. You can't totally see the one vein. And right above this are the pale, pale, 
the lemma with the parallel veins. Up here you can see the parallel veins on this lemma. This is a great picture that was taken by Chris Knoll. He's one of our wetland biologists. Uh, so the native lookalike for Glyceria maxima is Glyceria grandis. So it's the same genus, but a different species. Um, they're gonna differ in the leaf blade width, but there's this overlap. It's eight to 18 millimeters and six to 12. It doesn't help you a lot if like they're both measuring eight millimeters. So you wanna look at the leaf sheath edge texture and then the gloom length. So the leaf sheath edge that's gonna be here on Glyceria maxima is gonna feel scabrous. So a little bit rough to it. The grandis is gonna feel smooth. The upper gloom length of the maxima is double what it is of the grandest. So it's gonna just be bigger and hardier to go back a slide. So the glue, that would be this little leaf or bract that you're looking at is gonna be bigger on the invasive one than it is on the native one. Um, also worth mentioning is that when you have these species side by side, the maxima looks far more hardy. There's going to be more branches coming off of it um, than what you see on the grandis, which is fairly subjective, but when you see them side by side, it's fairly apparent. And then I have a series of photos because I thought they were great. These photos were taken by Jason Granberg, which is one of the uh, invasive plant guys in um, NHC. Um, these lighter colored flowers of the Glyceria. This is all Glyceria maxima that goes down the stream outlet. So this is earlier in the season because the flowers are still very um, much still opening. Um, this is it in the off season. So either probably late fall is my guess, but this is how dense it's going to get. Um, everything that you see in this picture is going to be Glyceria maxima. This is also Glyceria maxima, basically all the grass that you see all around these trees and along the water, that is Glyceria maxima. Um, you can see in this drainage ditch, this is all Glyceria maxima to going to under the highway. Um, this is a field of Glyceria maxima. And this is its distribution. It's not very widely established um, outside of Wisconsin, although we see a little bit in the Eastern Great Lakes state, not a ton. Um, we mainly have it in Southeast Wisconsin, a little bit in North Central Wisconsin. And then we have uh, these couple of populations in Price County. And then I think it's Northern Oneida County um, here. Um, and very likely that it's far more widely distributed. It's just a grass that not a lot of people look at, so it's under-documented. So we want people to, to let us know if they see it. Next, I'm gonna go into some cattails. Um, in general, the native cattails have a continuous male and female flowers. On the top here are the male parts on the bottom are the pistillate spikes. So these are the female flowers. Uh, so the native are fairly contiguous. The non-native you have this gap, a separation between the male and female flowers. Um, that's what we've always learned by, but in recent years a geneticist at the University of Illinois has told us that is not always true because these things hybridize a lot so that confuses us when we're out in the field where we're seeing this gap, but sometimes that gap's not always true. And then um, it turns out that it's actually is indeed the non-native um, sometimes when you still have no gap. But generally, we still hold that as true. If we see a population that's now expanding, it's becoming incredibly dense and nothing else can grow there, um, we can send it for genetic testing um, to get a confirmation on what indeed it is. The first cattail I'll talk about is narrow leaf cattail, typha and gustifolia. Um, the leaves are four to 10 millimeters wide, um, which, and they grow taller than what the flower spike is. So the flower spike ends here, but the leaves continue off the picture. Um, the stems in general are one to three meters tall. Um, the flowers, the male and female portions have 
are separated by that two to four inch gap. But like I said, there are two to four centimeter gap. Um, there's going to be variation when we see hybrids and we see hybrids a lot. Um, the spike is less than six inches though, and that can be a pretty sure thing and maybe helpful in identifying between the species. And then I just use um, the map from the herbarium website because we don't always inventory all the typha and gustafolia because it's so widespread in the state, similar to reed canary grass. Um, for typha ex glauca, so the hybrid cattail, um, the leaves are going to be variable um, between the broad leaf and the narrow leaf in width um, because you've got two different cattails that are hybridizing with different amounts of width. So they're going to be somewhere in between and it's not always going to be a very reliable characteristic. <coughs> The stems do grow to be two to three meters tall. You're gonna see that with a lot of the cattails. Um, the male and female are separated by a two to four centimeter gap, similar to um, the narrow leaf cattail. Uh, and the spike is greater than six inches tall. So they'll be a little bit taller for this, um, this flower spike, the pistillate flower spike. And then we have a less common cattail. The first two I went, went over, um, we don't inventory fully regularly because they're so established, but graceful cattail, we have very few populations in the state and we really appreciate if folks can keep a lookout for them. They grow up to three to five feet tall. They're often overgrown by surrounding vegetation so they could be easily missed. They have yellowish flower, let yellowish male flowers at the top and greenish female flowers at the bottom um, up to two inches below the male. So there's just a two inch gap essentially is what we're saying. Um, and this flower spike looks more compact. The picture on the left is really gonna be the best way that you're gonna see this. You can see Zach's hand. It's just a regular guy's hand. Those flowers are, the spike is tiny, like it's not very big. The plant overall, like it's very thin um, and inconspicuous, like I said. So imagine the size of his hand, but on each of these little flower spikes, like they're not very large and you can see where they will be missed if all the other vegetation, bulrushes, phragmites even um, grow up around that, it could be easily missed. <clears throat> um, and this is where we know it to be in Wisconsin. I think it's just four populations all in southeast Wisconsin. Most of them are um, either restoration, so one of them's at a, col a, a clover leaf along a interchange on a highway. Um, some are going to be in like private ponds or restoration areas. Um, so they're not widely established and we're just trying to figure out what's the best way to be able to monitor these and to see them um, given that they can be hidden by other vegetation. <clears throat> oh, and then we have southern cattail. Um, this one's a little bit more distinct. Uh, southern cattail are different in color, which we don't always rely on color because that can be subjective, but they're gonna have very pale yellow green leaves, um, less than five eighths of an inch wide. So a little more narrow. Um, they're best distinguished in all seasons by a small brown glands on the inner leaf sheath, about one to 10 centimeters from the base. So what that means is this is what the leaf on the picture on the right, this is a picture from Galen Smith, who used to be the typha expert at UW-Madison. Um, this leaf, when you look at these tall leaves of the cattail, you go down to the bottom of the leaf and pull it at the base of the stem, about one to 10 centimeters from the base of this leaf. So you gotta get down into the wetland and pull it up. Um, you'll see these really distinct mucilaginous brown, brown glands, but on the inside. So this is the inside and that's the outside. So and it's a little bit curved when you're facing it. Um, this is your best way to know what it's going to look like and other a couple other cattails will have that but nothing will be so easily distinguished like with the naked eye to see that. Um, the flowers also look different in color. The male flowers um, at the top have a cinnamon brown color to them um, and then the female flowers 
at the bottom have this really distinct sausage shape. They're really tightly packed together. Um, the, and the gap between these, the male and the female spikes are two and a half to five centimeters. So it can be pretty, pretty big. Um, and they grow somewhat tall, um, five to 13 feet tall. Um, so they'll be more, more noticeable, of course, than the Typha lexmanii, that graceful cattail, the last one I talked to you about. They're bigger and they're gonna be different in color, more of a lime green and cinnamon colored um, spikelets than the other cattails. And we only have a couple populations in Madison, well, in Med Middleton, technically, um, by Costco and a couple different um, places that go along the stream to Pheasant Branch Creek. Um, they've been seen there for, I think since 2013. So they've been present for a while. I even driving around yesterday, I went and visited them to see if I could get some better pictures of some of the brown mucilaginous um, bases of the stem. And, and they're still there and, and doing quite well. Um, but like good chance that they're somebody, somewhere else in the state. Um, they're probably, planted there on purpose as part of a restoration project. So whatever person planted them there, likely planted them other places. We just haven't heard about them yet. Um, my phenology chart doesn't show all the species that I went over, um, but we can work on getting that information to you guys so that you have it. But this is most things you can see during, during the summer, summer months. Um, and we'll have access to this PowerPoint for you guys too. I think, so that's all I had for you and I'm gonna pass it off to Anne. Sorry that I'm... Um, I'm gonna... I hope it's okay, but I didn't go over the questions. I, I figure we could just go through them at the end of the PowerPoint. I can read through them while Anne goes over her slides. Sounds good. And I didn't see any questions come up yet for you, Maureen. I think people were still talking about the swimmer's itch question. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. So, um, well, hi, everybody. I'm Anne Pierce, and I'm going to get us to some drier land here. I work with the Wisconsin First Detector Network and primarily work with more terrestrial plants. So the plants I'm covering are those that you'll definitely be able to find in wetland areas um, and along stream banks and, and areas like that, but you'll find them kind of further away from water as well. And so we're gonna start with lesser celandine. Um, and it's actually, I think we're kind of hitting the, the end of the time of the year where you'll actually be able to see this plant. Um, it's a spring ephemeral, a member of the buttercup family. It's a nice ground cover plant with glossy, dark green kidney shaped leaves. Um, and the things you'll want to look for on this one is that there's only one flower per stalk. And then if you look at the picture kind of at the lower left, there's three green sepals at the base of each flower. And then the stems will have these whitish bulbs on them, and then there will be tubers underground. So those three features are pretty distinct with our lesser celandine. And you'll notice my maps look a little bit different. Um, several of the species that I'm covering, because they can be found across a wider range of habitats, um, they're not necessarily as well represented in the lakes and AIS viewer. So I'm pulling the maps from um, Wifton's online map, which is called the Wistip Viewer. So in any case, with lesser celandine, we've got populations in southeastern Wisconsin and then a few in the Madison area. And it's most often confused with marsh marigolds. Um, marsh marigolds also a spring ephemeral. They're blooming at the same time in the same sort of habitats. Um, overall, marsh marigold is larger than lesser celandine, and it can have two to five flowers per stalk compared to just that single flower. It doesn't have green sepals below the flower and it doesn't have bulbs or tubers. So you can look for those characteristics to differentiate these two species. Next up, I'm gonna cover giant hogweed. This is one of those members of the carrot family. So earlier, Maureen was talking about the, um, the water parsley and showing several members of the carrot family. So they're all characterized by these umbel or kind of umbrella shaped flower heads that you can see in the center picture. 
Now giant hogweed, as its name suggests, is giant. So it can grow up to 20 feet tall. Um, it's got very distinct stems, as you can see in that picture on the right. They've got coarse white hairs and then this very distinct purple modeling along the stems. Um, few populations scattered across the state. There's kind of a concentration up in Iron County and then other populations have been found kind of in the central part of the state and um, over closer to Lake Michigan. The native species that this is most likely to get confused with is our, our cow parsnip. It has similar shaped leaves. It's got those large white umbels as well. Um, and cow parsnip can grow up to 10 feet tall. So, you know, if you're walking along a stream bank and you see this, it can look like a very large plant. Um, so just keep in mind that the giant hogweed is giant, not just big. Um, and when you look at the stems of cow parsnip, they have much softer hairs on them. And they do have some purplish colors sometimes, but um, compare that to our giant hogweed, it's not as distinct of a contrast between kind of the greenish and purplish tones as you see with this giant hogweed stem. Another member of the carrot family is poison hemlock. Uh, this one is going to be starting to bloom right now and will kind of bloom throughout the summer. Um, with this one on the stem, you're gonna look for a smooth stem that has some kind of purplish modeling. This picture doesn't show much purple. You can, on the right side, you can see just some very fine purple specks, but you can see more purple on the stem than what this picture shows. Um, the leaves, when you crush them, kind of have an unpleasant odor. And then the reason I'm pointing out that the veins end at the tips of the teeth, which is gonna be hard to see, but the vein just kind of goes down the center of the, the teeth on the leaves, is that that will help differentiate it from the look-alike species. So there are populations of poison hemlock kind of scattered primarily south central and southwestern Wisconsin, but there are a few other populations around as well. And based on habitat, it is probably most likely to be confused with our native water hemlock. Um, and so if you look closely at the leaves on this one, the veins actually end kind of between the teeth instead of at the tip of the teeth. Um, they bloom around the same time. I would say the leaves on this native water hemlock also look much less fern-like than the poison hemlock. Um, of course, there's a bunch of other what we call these weedy white umbels. So members of the carrot family that have these white umbel flower heads, uh, many of them grow in more upland habitats though. So you can definitely use habitat as a clue to help differentiate some of these species. So next up is our European marsh thistle. This one, as you can see from the map, is uh, one of our more unique invasive plants as, uh, in that it's much more common in the northern part of the state than the southern part of the state. Usually the reverse is true. Um, so this has clusters of many flowers at the, the tip of the plant. If you look closely at the flower head, the bracts below it will have kind of a single, in this case, darker purple spine at the tip of the bract. Um, the stems are both hairy and spiky. And then uh, it can, in terms of the number of flowers and the size of the flowers, maybe look a little bit like Canada thistle, but it grows much taller and, and has that very spiny stem where Canada thistle does not have spines along the whole stem. And the native lookalike for this one is our, our native marsh or swamp thistle. And so if you look at the bracts in the middle picture on this flower, a few of them do look like they have that kind of purplish tip, but the more distinguishing characteristic is that each bract has this white stripe down the center of it um, and that's a very common characteristic of, of our native thistles. You'll also notice that this native marsh thistle, um, the stem is a bit hairy but it's not spiny at all. Moving on to hairy willow herb, um, this one has been primarily found along Lake Michigan. Um, it looks a lot like fireweed, same genus. So what you're gonna look for on this is that uh, it has opposite leaves. And then if you take a close look at the petals, um, each petal is notched. So that's a good key to look for. Versus our native fireweed, it has alternate leaves. Um, and then if you look at the petals on this one, they might have like a teeny tiny notch on it, but generally they're not as deeply notched as the willow herb. 
So up next are our knotweed species. And of course, there's lots of taxonomic confusion or disagreement about this. So you might um, see the Latin names of this. Uh, it'll be different depending on what resource you're looking at. Um, but these are all perennial plants. They look a bit like bamboo. Uh, they have kind of these swollen nodes, which you can see at the top of the right hand picture. And that's why people say it looks like bamboo. It's got tall arching stems. And although there are three species, they all have these same characteristics, um, alternate leaves, and then the lower center picture, you can see they get these plumes of kind of tiny greenish to white flowers late, late in the summer, August into September. And our knotweeds are pretty widespread across the state, um, although I think this one, because it can be co common across several habitats, might not be as widely mapped um, as it could be. And to compare the species a little bit, so our three species are Japanese knotweed and giant knotweed, and then their hybrid, which is Bohemian knotweed. Um, Japanese knotweed leaves, looking at the right side of this drawing, are the smallest. They kind of have a squared off base on the left side of the drawing, the giant knotweed leaves, and the plant itself is going to be much, much larger. The leaves have a more heart-shaped base, and then that hybrid, the Bohemian knotweed, it kind of has the intermediate characteristics in terms of the shape of the leaf base um, and the overall size of the plant. Next up, we have golden creeper. And this actually is not yet regulated in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it's fairly new to the state. Um, and as you can see from the map in the center, some of the initial populations were found um, kind of up in northwestern Wisconsin along the Minnesota border in the St. Croix River watershed. There's been some found in Grant County, Waukesha County, and then a few other um, suspected populations in south central Wisconsin as well. This is a member of the cucumber family. So if you've grown cucumbers in your garden, it's got the leaves have that kind of same rough texture, similar shaped flowers. So it's got these one inch yellow flowers that'll bloom kind of mid, mid to late summer. And then it produces these red hairy fruits. Uh, so sometimes this plant will also be called red hailstone and that's referring to that fruit. And if you look at the picture in the center bottom, um, everything that you see <laughs> along the ground of this picture and kind of climbing up into the trees is this golden creeper. So this is a plant that also has tubers. Um, and so when it gets into these riparian areas along our rivers and streams that flood frequently, that uh, can get spread very easily downstream. Um, another vine that we'll see in our wet, wettish areas is Japanese hops. So this is an annual vine, but it can grow up to 35 feet long. Generally with the Japanese hops, you're looking for five or more lobes on each leaf. And then the petiole, which is the leaf stem, is gonna be longer than that leaf blade itself. So you can check that by just folding the stem over the top of the leaf. And if it's the Japanese hops, it's going to be longer than that leaf. Um, the stipules, which we don't have a great picture of here, but that's, you're gonna find those at the base of the leaves. Those are gonna be fringed in hairs. And then it has very prickly downward pointing hairs all along the stem. And this one has prim primarily been found in southwestern Wisconsin with a few other populations kind of scattered across the state. And then there is the native common hops. And this one, generally, the leaves have three lobes, but they can have five. Uh, that petiole, though, that leaf stem is going to be shorter than the leaf blade on our native common hops. And then the stipules, uh, which you can see in the lower right hand picture, it's the structure at the base of the leaves. Uh, on our common hops, they don't have the hairs on them, they're just smooth. And then the common hops do have downward pointing hairs like the Japanese hops, but they're not as prickly and um, there's not nearly, they don't cover the stem nearly as densely as they do on the Japanese hops. All right, up next is Phragmites, and any of you in the Lake Michigan Basin will know this plant much, much better than me because I don't actually deal with it in the field that much. Um, but as you can see from the map, it's, we've got it all over the eastern half of Wisconsin, but it is spreading west. Um, so with our invasive Phragmites, you're looking for 
kind of rigid and more rough stems. It grows very, very densely. The leaves tend to be kind of a bluish gray green and they will stay on the stem into the winter. And it's got these very dense feathery flower heads kind of late in the summer. And compared to the native Phragmites, uh, this picture kind of shows a nice side-by-side -side comparison, particularly of the flower heads. So you can see how much less dense that native flower head is on the left. Um, in the growing season, our native Phragmites tends to have a shiny reddish, reddish stem versus the non-native will have more of a dull tan to green stem. Um, the native doesn't grow nearly as densely in, in stands as the non-native. And then this table on the left shows a few more characteristics like the ligule length. Um, and so a quick picture of that. Um, I do want to point out though that now the orientation of the pictures has changed. So now our non-native is on the left and our native is on the right in both of these pictures. So just a quick look at that ligule length. It's a bit shorter on the non-native and then um, it's a nice comparison of kind of the stem colors in the growing season. All right, moving on to Japanese stiltgrass. This is a species that has not yet been found in Wisconsin, um, but the picture at the right is from Virginia, so it's everywhere in the mid-Atlantic, and the ground is just carpeted in stiltgrass um, in this kind of wet wooded forest. So this is an annual grass. It only grows up to about one or three feet tall at its tallest, but it will also kind of spread as a mat. Um, the thing to look for on this is looking at the leaves. Um, they're pointed at both ends. They are a bit asymmetrical. And so it looks like one end is kind of a bit more round or one side of the leaf looks a bit more round compared to the other side. But the really distinguishing characteristic of this one is it has this silvery stripe uh, right down the center of the leaf. And it might get confused with our native white grass, which can grow in a similar habitat. Um, the leaves on our white grass are longer and narrower and they don't have that distinct silvery stripe on them. I guess that's all I have uh, for slides. So we did have one question about, I think probably referring to the Phragmites and whether that, whether the non-native Phragmites has a hollow stem. Um, and then Paul just answered with, yes, all of our grasses tend to have hollow stems, but the joints will be solid. So I think we should have time for, questions from any of us presenters. Um, I did have some wrap up slides. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. You should go ahead and throw those up. <laughs> yeah, can you guys see my screen? Not, here it comes. Okay. Yep, we got it. Yeah, so to conclude all this, I just thought it'd be helpful, even though we're not really talking about monitoring and how to report things, I'm just going to casually mention how to report things. Um, so when we do see invasive species, we ask that you report um, to our DNR, either through entering data into the Surface Water Integrated Monitoring System, um, and to let the regional DNR AIS coordinator know. I have red boxes here that, um, show that you go to our DNR website, just search invasives. This is the first page that you'll see pop up. It's the report invasive species page. And then the aquatic shoreland and wetland tab. Um, there's this link here to who your regional DNR AIS coordinator is. I know that there were multiple offers throughout the chat to list, hey, send me a picture. Like that's great today do too. Um, and then also let your regional DNR person know because they can get it entered into our database and then show your dot on the map for your discovery. Um, we have links. I only actually added one link here, but we'll share this PowerPoint when it's done. We'll have it available um, with hyperlinks to where you can get more information on these ID resources. So for NR40, for the Citizen Lake Monitoring um, Handbook through WIFTN um, and the Water Action Volunteers. Um, and to let you know that we will be hosting a webinar um, tomorrow on how to take photographs of species when you do find them. And then we'll talk about how to submit your photographs uh, 
to get them verified uh, to help the reporting process move along. That's tomorrow morning. We have it scheduled from 10 to 11, but we don't anticipate that it, it will take an hour, but you're more than welcome to attend that. Um, we also have a pending webinar on solo monitoring. Um, given co coronavirus, um, we have to reevaluate how we're going out in teams and in pairs, um, and we're going to be developing or providing guidance on how to go out to look on your own safely for invasive species to report them. And that can be for DNR staff, for partners, and for citizens. Um, but that's still pending. DNR is working through the Badger Bounce Back plan. And we will have our plan, um, I believe by June 8th, what we will be doing in the field given coronavirus. And then we'll share these solo monitoring techniques shortly thereafter. So early June, just a couple more weeks yet. And then towards the end of June, Paul is going to be hosting an aquatic plant ID webinar um, that he's shared links, I think, with folks um, on where that is. But just to let you guys know, there's future training opportunities. And if you have questions, I put all the presenters information and email addresses um, on the screen. And then for fun, I'm giving you this link that will include um, when we share the PowerPoint with you guys. If you want to look up some of those songs, how I played the Clean Boats, Clean Water song, they also have multiple other, other songs um, that you can listen to. Let's see. So I don't think that there were any other questions in the chat. Um, there are guys... a few more in there now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maureen, I'm going to let you take the spiny water flea one. I believe Sean's talking about the guile flowage. Oh. And he mentioned that the flowage was stocked with bluegills uh, in an attempt to control spiny water flea through predation by bluegills. And he's wondering if that's an effective method oh. for controlling spiny water fleas. I did. I don't know if it's an effective method for control. I'm familiar with it. I saw a graduate student present on this, how they bite... They bite, they're able to eat them um, without it getting cut, caught in their gullet. I didn't know that they had stocked the bluegill there. Um, so I don't know how effective that is as a method. And to be honest, we haven't done quantitative assessments out on the guile flowage or any, well, not just any, um, the UW-Madison Center for Limnology is doing some quantitative estimates in the Madison Lakes. And I think on Trout Lake, but no one's done an assessment on the guile flowage. Um, but that's something that we hope to do, uh, probably not this year, but in years to come. Um, but good question. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> there is hey, Marine. a video out there somewhere of a pumpkin yeah. seed eating spiny water fleas and spitting out the spines, I believe. Yeah, I remember seeing her at UMISC or something. Chris, you had a comment? Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to bring up. Um, I, it was pumpkin seeds that I that she was talking about because they're the jaw structure of a pumpkin seed. So in southern states, there's a shell cracker, which is another type of panfish. They're very effective at cracking open uh, mussels and snails. They've they've got extra or or enlarged muscles that allow them to do that. And apparently, pumpkin seeds do to too, which allows them to manipulate the spiny water fleas to eat them. That's just what I recall from that presentation. Yeah, I think you're right, Chris. And the next question is about hops. So maybe Anne can take this one, um, asking about tips for removal of Japanese hops or treatment of a site next to a bridge. Right, so off the top of my head, I don't have recommendations, but I will share the link. Uh, we do have an extension fact sheet on Japanese hops. So if this is information you'd like to pass on to the DOT, um, presuming that they would be treating it uh, during the bridge replacement, we can do that. And I also, um, I know Matt Walrath was on the call and I'm pretty sure he covers Lafayette County. So I just wanted to see. Yeah, I am call here, we can just, follow up to, later he might be able to provide additional information because he works in Lafayette County. Yeah, and if it's by water, you need to work with the local um, DNR because it's 
if you're by water and if you're going to use chemical, if there's going to be anything that's causing erosion, you'll have to get a permit through the DNR. And I don't know, is the, is the Lafayette, is that Sue Graham or are we in Jody Lepsch? I honestly don't know. But Matt, you would? that's Sue's area. Okay. Yeah. So you'd have, you'd, you need to reach out to Sue Graham. But I think Matt can be like a good starting point too. Okay. Uh, Chris posted a comment that he thinks Fisa fontanalis was the, the Latin name of the snail that he thinks had the highest percentage of transferring swimmers itch. That's one of our, our native small pond snails. Um, Maureen, maybe you can talk about APM permits needed for pesticide treatment of invasives in wetlands and open water situations. Um, <laughs> yeah, you need to work with the local uh, lake coordinator in the APM program. Anywhere that you're going to book chemical, do manual or chemical removal, you'll need a, a either NR 107 or 109 permit. I don't have an easy map of where the lake coordinators are, but if you contact your regional AIS coordinator, they ch chances are they work in the same office as the APM person that you need to work with. I hope that was an okay answer. <laughs> well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I guess we can give it a minute here and then we can just wrap it up. Sounds good. Thanks for, thanks to all the presenters. I thought everybody did a really nice job. And thanks everybody for attending. I, was, I guess I'm surprised, but not surprised. I'm sure there's a lot of people still working from home and not really going out in the field, but it was a beautiful day here in Madison. All right, well, Matt put his, his email address in the chat for Shelly to contact him. And I think that's it in the chat. So thanks everybody for attending. And this was recorded, so we'll be posting in the recording and sending it out widely. Uh, it should be available in just a day or two. So with that, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. <laughs>